Hello, everybody. Let's continue with the talk about cloud native services, change the focus a little bit towards data and zoom in into security. And who am I and why is it that eight hours ago I was not having any plans for tonight and now I'm here in front of you and talking about data security? My name is Natalie Godek. I'm a cloud architect at Zencore. Zencore is a tiny boutique cloud consultancy focused on Google Cloud. My background is in systems engineering and cloud engineering and in DevOps, and I particularly like everything about infrastructure, data, and security. I'm also a photographer, and you can find me on socials at Uvesvit. The talk about data is everywhere. Everybody is talking about data, how businesses have to use their data to or protect themselves into the future, how AI is going to take everybody's job. It's not going to take out everybody's job, at least not mine. I've tried it. It's really rubbish in cloud engineering. How do you do data? How do you sit on those vast amounts of data? And what do you do to use it and utilize it and drive value out of it? And it's true that everybody sits on tons and tons and tons of data. You have your event streams with everything from your microservices talking together. You have your logs, so many logs everywhere. Marketing data, client data, your partner data sets, publicly available data. There's so, so, so much of it and you can and should be using it to its full extent. And luckily cloud providers have loads of products to um, build things out of your data and based on your data. But hey, wait, uh, what about sensitive data? Can you store sensitive data in the cloud? I once gave a talk about cloud native data platforms in Switzerland, and the only question everybody in the audience had was, can you actually store like personal data, health data, banking data in the cloud? Is that safe? You, can you actually do that? And yes, you actually can. And in fact, your typical data platform, if you were to use, say, Google Cloud, might use something like this. You would have your object store in cloud storage in buckets. You would have Spanner or Cloud SQL for your relational databases. You might have memory store for time series. Your workloads might run on Google Kubernetes engine or something like that. You would use PubSub for event streams. BigQuery when you want to use analytics and actually do something with the data and find out something out of your all of you those logs and client data in event streams and the piles and piles and piles of it that you have in your systems. And if you want to take another step further and manage your data warehouse and data lake centrally, you might want to try Dataplex. You would run your data pipelines on Composer and maybe plug in some event-based workflows in Cloud Functions or Cloud Run. And then if you want to go into AI and ML and train some language models, you would use Vertex AI. Similarly, if you use AWS, you would have something like this. You would have your object storage in buckets in S3 and your relational data in RDS. You might use OpenSearch for Elastic Data and Elastic Cache for Cache. You might run on EKS for containers. You might use MSK for Kafka for streaming for event services. And if you want then to use analytics, you would plug in Glue, Athena, use Kinesis to transform all of the data, and use SageMaker to train those models. But all of those services are public APIs. Every single resource in the cloud is a public API endpoint. Every BigQuery dataset is just one HTTPS request away. Your buckets are open by default. We're going to talk about that. Everything is a public API. How do you deal with that? How do you secure that? And in fact, serverless products are not only pub public APIs, but they also communicate over the internet. So if you have in AWS, if you have some workloads that are running in your subnet privately, you might have your VMs and your containers running in, this, in a subnet. If they then communicate with an S3 bucket, that goes out to the internet. Not many people know that, and it's really sneaky. Similarly, if you have a Lambda and it goes and talks to your Kafka or your RDS instance, that will go out through the internet and into your subnet. That is, again, sneaky and not really cool. We really need to do something about that and why is it like by default like that? To fix that, you would use VPC endpoints. For your buckets, for your Lambda, for your Redis, for your CloudWatch, you would deploy VPC endpoints, which will then 
um, using routing, you would deploy also routes to tell your private services to actually route requests to those services through the VPC endpoints, and then the communication stays within your network. It is the same story for Google Cloud. If you have some services running on compute within your network, then that stays within your network. However, anything that is serverless, storage, BigQuery, functions, run, build, scheduler, jobs, and the ton of others, all of that is not running in your VPC. It's not running in your private network. And if someone, your analyst, or someone in the data science team is accessing data in BigQuery from the corporate laptop, that request goes over the internet to the public internet API endpoint of BigQuery. To solve that in Google Cloud, you have VPC service controls. VPC service controls is like firewall on steroids, where firewall works on levels three and four, it's network, it's IP addresses, it's ports. VPC service controls takes into account the IP addresses, but also the identity, also the device parameters, also the region where the request comes from. And all of that goes into filtering out the requests that are actually allowed to access your resources. To use it, you would select your APIs that you want to protect. And you would select the projects that you want to protect those APIs, APIs in. A project in Google Cloud is like an account in AWS. You would put them then in a perimeter. From that point on, any unauthorized request will be denied, and only those requests that you really know are coming from a trusted source will be allowed to access those APIs within the perimeter. In order to define which requests are actually allowed to access your APIs, you have three options. You have bridges, access levels, and ingress and egress policies. Bridges allow you to connect projects in different perimeters. You might want to have different perimeters for different purposes. And if you want projects in them to communicate, you will need a bridge between them. Access levels define which source, which identity, is allowed to access those APIs in the perimeter. It might be IP addresses, that corporate Wi-Fi, corporate VPN. It might be a service account, like an identity of your CI CD, or if you're running I don't know, a security software, and that needs access to all of your resources, you might want to whitelist that identity, and so on. Egress and egress policies allow you to define a specific type of API call that will be allowed to come into the perimeter, ingress, and come out of the perimeter for egress. This is really handy if you, for example, need to share data with a different organization. You cannot have a bridge between projects in different organizations, in which case you will have an ingress and egress policy on what both sides telling which projects, which identities, which APIs can communicate. And that way you have the allowed requests come in and everything that is not allowed just denied. The way it works is by changing the DNS resolution of those APIs. So when your BigQuery datasets are available usually on bigquery.googleapis.com, and that's a public API endpoint. When you put the API in a perimeter, that changes to restricted.googleapis.com. That is available on a specific IP address. If you need to do a VPN tunnel something with your local infrastructure or with your AWS if you're doing multi-cloud, the, all of the requests that are going to those protected projects will then be routed to the restricted Google APIs, in which in case then the request is filtered and all of the different parameters of the request get analyzed according to bridges, access levels, and ingress and ingress policies to define whether or not that request can come in. And the communication between the Google APIs within the perimeter will stay within the Google network, which is also great. But speaking of that, Serverless is not always serverless. In fact, it's, it's not actually serverless. So when you're running a cloud function or cloud run, it's just a container in the cloud and you throw it in the cloud and you're like, hey, okay, fine, that's serverless. BigQuery is serverless. They're in the same project. I'll put them in the perimeter. They should talk, right? No, they will not. You will receive this beautiful error that anybody who has ever worked with VPC service controls knows way too well. What happens? Well, serverless, like I said, is not actually serverless. It runs somewhere on some server in, a, in some network. In this case, it runs in a so-called shadow project. 
So you have your project in which you deploy your data sets and your cloud function. However, that cloud function will actually be executed on a shadow project that you don't see. So it's coming from a different network. And that's why it fails, because it's not, it doesn't sit in the same network, despite what we would hope for. How do you solve it? You have two options. Option one, you can take the identity of that function. So a function runs as an identity. For those of you who, are, who work with AWS only, it's not like in AWS you would attach a role or like a policy. Um, in Google you would have an identity, an actual service account attached to each workload. So you take that service account, it has an email address, you create an access level, attach it to the perimeter and you say this service account is allowed to enter this perimeter. Um, in this case, the request is coming from a trusted identity, so it will be allowed to access the query. Um, and the communication should stay in Google Network. Your second option is to actually deploy a subnet and deploy a serverless VPC connector, similarly to VPC endpoints in AWS, and have your function pretend to run in your network. In this case, the request comes from a trusted network because it's the same project and the request will be allowed without any access levels. Whichever you want to manage, is, is, it's a choice. I wanted to hope that my projects will be absolutely networkless because I only run serverless workloads. But hey, no, you actually sometimes do need a network and you need a VPC connector in order to secure your serverless communications. And another thing that I want to add is um, disable public access to your buckets, please. Okay, <laughs> we have a deal. <laughs> um, of course, unless you want public access, but um, I don't know if 300,000 buckets were intended to be public on AWS, if 100,000 bucket buckets on Google Cloud were intended to be public. Um, this is a screenshot from a um, service online that you can Google and find all of those open buckets. Um, and you can uh, like find names, like f search for file names. So I search for credentials here and there are so many credentials. And then I search for ID RSA, in the encryption keys. And some of them were .pub. Okay, not great, but fine. But some of them were not .pub. They were private keys, openly available in public buckets somewhere out there. So please disable public access to your buckets. It's not disabled by default. You can use organization policies in both AWS and GCP to make sure that nobody creates buckets with public access and then whitelist certain places where you actually want them to be publicly accessible. Um, but yeah. Um, if you if you if you want to see that, um, like have fun with searching up buckets, just look up on Google, find public AWS buckets. It's there. <laughs> um, and with that, I thank you very much. And if you have any questions. <laughs>